This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from opentuition.com. All right, we're in the middle of chapter 11 of the free lecture notes, uh, looking at uh, ways in which companies can raise finance from shareholders, equity finance. Uh, and I've, I broke the lecture into two parts to say that it was going on too long. But the first one, I talked about different ways companies can issue new shares. And we looked at the arithmetic involved uh, when there's a rights issue. Uh, there's a bit left here, but no more arithmetic. If you look at the third page of the chapter, you'll see it talks about bonus issues, stock splits and script dividends. Um, no arithmetic involved here, as I said, but uh, be aware what these are. Uh, first of all, a bonus issue or a script issue, two words are the same thing. Uh, you should have actually heard about from um, in paper F3, or whatever you did at university to exempt you. Uh, although I appreciate this isn't a financial accounts exam, so I'm not worried in the slightest about what the accounting entries would be. But a bonus issue is not a source of finance because it's an issue of free shares to existing shareholders. And again, a bit like rights issues, uh, uh, they must be issued fairly. So there might be, for example, um, a one-for-one one bonus issue. One-for-one, one-for-two, one-for-four, just like we had with rights. Uh, so the number of new shares you get issued depends on how many you currently have. If it's one-for-one, then if you've currently got 100 shares, you get given another 100. However, the shares are given free of charge. You're not paying for them. And so the company isn't raising any cash. It's not a source of finance. However, you are expected to be aware of it and the reason companies might do this, you know, why give free shares? It sounds daft. It's a waste of time if they're not getting any money. But the reason companies do it, or, or, or when companies tend to do it, is when the share price on the stock exchange gets very high. Um, you know, companies like Microsoft, the share price on the stock exchange at times gets extremely high. And you know, if you see a company with a share price of all $50, psychologically people don't like that. You know, suppose I had $100 to invest. Well, if the share price is $50, I can only buy two shares. Maybe that can find another company where the share price is only a dollar. And if I have $100 to invest, I can buy 100 shares. Now, it's psychological. If the share price is $50, it means the company is doing a lot, lot better. It's a much bigger company. It shouldn't make any difference to me. But it's psychological again. That, you know, people don't like paying $50 a share. It seems such a lot of money. If the share price is only a dollar, you can buy a lot more. Uh, and so, when the share price gets very high, shareholders aren't buying and selling as many. And I appreciate on the stock exchange, uh, when the shares have already been issued, if you buy shares on the stock exchange, you're buying them from another shareholder. You know, share is, it's a market. Shareholders are buying and selling shares to each other. Well, if the share price gets high, people aren't doing much buying and selling, and shareholders don't like that. They want to be easily able to sell the shares to somebody else. And so if they have a, a script issue, a bonus issue, well, think about it. It's like rights issue with no money. 
if the share price is currently 50, and suddenly they have a one-for-one -one bonus issue and everybody has twice as many shares, well, they're not paid anything. They're not going to be worth any more. It's, but what's going to happen? Instead of perhaps having 100 shares that are, at the moment are worth $50 each, if they have a one-for-one -one issue, you suddenly have 200 shares. But they'll only be worth $25 each. So you're no better or worse off. You can't be any better off. You've not paid any money in. But it, it does reduce the price. And so you do find quite often that big companies, when the share price starts to get high, then it's quite common to have a bonus issue because it does reduce the price and means that people are buying and selling more. They become what we call more marketable. So that's a bonus issue. I say no numbers involved. Just be aware what it is and to be safe. Think about what I just said about why companies might do it. Um, the next one, stock split, which is very similar uh, because, it, again, it's not a source of finance. It doesn't raise any money. Uh, but the shares are split in value. So what effectively happens, um, if they've got 100 shares in issue, they have a nominal value, I'll talk much more about that in later chapters of the dollar, they may effectively, in a sense, withdraw those shares and replace them with 200 shares of 50 cents. Now, don't worry about that nominal value bit, but they're, they're sort of withdrawing the old ones, issuing new ones. So again, you've got just like a bonus issue. You end up with more shares. A bonus issue, you add 100, you get another 100 of the same share, you've now 200. Uh, with a stock split, your existing 100 are cancelled, but you're given 200 instead. Uh, and so again, it's not a source of finance, but it's a way of reducing the share price on the stock exchange, which I'll explain why they might want to do it. Finally, though, a script dividend. And although you should be aware of all three, this is, the, for the exam, the most important of the three. A script dividend is where shareholders are offered shares instead of a cash dividend. You see, conventionally, dividends are paid out in cash. You get a dividend of five cents a share or whatever. But it's very common these days for companies to give you the choice and say, well, you can either have cash or you can have the same value of shares, of new shares in the company. So if your dividend is a thousand, dollars, if that's what you're entitled to, as I say, you have the choice, take your thousand dollars in cash if you want, or instead, we'll give you some new shares worth a thousand dollars. And it's quite nice because, firstly, normally shareholders have the choice, so if you want the cash, you take the cash. If you don't need the cash, you get some new shares. <clears throat> so shareholders aren't forced into anything, I say it's their choice, but the company loves this because it is a source of finance.
If so you're entitled, let's say, to a dividend of a thousand, and if you don't have a script dividend, they give you a thousand in cash. The company wants to raise money. Well, they could then have a rights issue and say, will you buy some new shares and give us a thousand? Well, with a script dividend, none of that hassle. They just say, right, instead of taking the cash, please will you, in a sense, buy some new shares and we'll keep the thousand. And we can use it to expand to invest in the company. So in that sense, it is a source of finance. Uh, it's slightly unusual in that it's not as though you're paying in directly a thousand, but it means the company is having to pay out a thousand less. So in that sense, they are raising finance. If they didn't do this, they'd have had to pay out a thousand. Uh, by doing this, if you elect to take the shares instead, they're keeping the thousand. It's as though they've effectively raised it. So as I say, it's um, become more and more popular for companies to give that offer. What normally happens is they send uh, you a letter saying, you know, we've got to have this policy. In future, do you want to take cash or do you want to take shares? Uh, and then whichever you choose, from then on you carry on getting cash or you carry on getting shares. If you ever want to change, uh, then there's a form and then you can switch from taking cash to taking shares or vice versa. All right, finally, the last page of rule. It, the most important source of shareholder finance for any company is what we call internally generated. And what we mean by internal, uh, internally generated is using retained earnings. Remember, profits earned by the company belong to shareholders. And some companies, very few, each year might pay out all their earnings as dividend. It's shareholders' money. But of course, most companies don't. I may have earned, my company may have earned 10,000 this year. I can afford to pay a dividend of 10,000, but why don't I? It's very unusual to pay out the full dividend. I may pay out a dividend of only perhaps 2,000. And why? You know, I have enough cash to pay out 10. Why am I only paying them a dividend of two? Well, it's because, of course, that the other 8,000 we're keeping in the company Retained is the remaining 8,000. And why are we keeping it in the company? What's it doing there? Well, we'll use it to invest and expand the company. And that's what most companies do. I think you're probably almost certainly well aware. Most companies do not pay all their earnings out as dividend. They keep some back. Not for the fun of it, but they keep some back because they need some cash to buy new machines to expand the company. If they always paid out their earnings as dividend, the company couldn't expand. And it's the most obvious source of finance of all. You know, come on, if I need to buy a machine for 2000 I'm not going to start issuing shares or, for that matter, taking loans. If we're making 10,000 uh, earnings, Surely, instead of paying a dividend of eight, I'll keep 2,000 in order to buy this new machine I need. So it's the most important source of finance of all. Uh, obviously, there is a limit, you see. Um, if I'm only earning 10,000, the most cash I've available there is 10,000 by paying no dividend. 
if we want to buy a new machine for 100,000, retained earnings aren't enough, I'm going to have to issue some more shares or take a loan. Uh, but, so there is a limit, obviously, but it's the first place any business will look when it needs more money. Um, reduce the dividend. Uh, and in theory, shareholders shouldn't care. You know, shareholders know, oh, well, they could pay us a dividend of 10,000. This year they're only paying me 2,000. Why? Oh, no problem. They've retained aid. So they're going to expand the company. I'll get more money next year as the company gets bigger. Um, and then later chapters for different reasons. I'll put numbers to that for you. But in theory, shareholders shouldn't care. A small dividend now will mean bigger dividends later because they're retaining to grow the company, to invest. Now, that's what paragraph 5.1 is saying, the dividend irrelevancy theory. In theory, it's irrelevant how much dividend they pay. Ultimately, at some stage, you'll get the whole 10,000, whether it's this year or whether it's next year when they've expanded. However, in practice, companies need to be careful of two things. I'll do them in reverse. Well, no, I'll do them in the order. The first is the clientele effect. When, uh, when people are deciding which companies to buy shares in, some people, and perhaps old people like me, are more concerned about getting cash. You know, if you're old and you're not working as a result, uh, and you've invested money, you want to get cash in, you want to get nice big dividends. And so you'll choose a company that pays high dividends. You know, if a company is paying, is earning 9,000 and paying out a dividend of, um, sorry, 10,000, is paying out a dividend of 10,000, great. I'll get nice income each year. All right, this company won't grow much because, well, it won't grow at all in theory because they're not keeping any money back to invest. But an old person might find that company terribly attractive. I'm, I'm old. I'm not worried about what might happen in 20 years. I don't care if the company's not growing. They're giving nice big cash payouts. As somebody younger who's working, doesn't need the cash so much, might prefer a company that retains a lot. Okay, they're paying a much lower dividend, only 2,000, but because they retained 8,000 and they're going to buy new machines, etc., this company will grow. And so again, a young person might not be concerned so much about the cash. What they'd be more concerned about is the dividends will grow in the future. The company will grow. It will get more valuable. So people have the choice. So I say some people invest in companies that pay big dividends but don't grow much. Other companies, uh, sorry, other people prefer to invest in companies that pay low dividends but will grow a lot. Well, that's fine. But if the company ever changes its policy, then people are going to be upset. You know, suppose that I'm an old person. I invested in that company because I wanted a big dividend. Well, if that company suddenly decides, oh, we're going to change our policy, we'll stop paying big dividends, we'll pay much lower dividends, but it'll grow. Well, fine, but I'm not happy. The sole reason I bought shares in this company was because they were paying a big dividend. I don't want them to change it. And that's called the clientele effect. The companies have to be careful. Whatever the theory says, they have to be careful about how shareholders will react. Shareholders choose the company because of the way they're paying dividends. And so you do tend to find in practice that companies tend to have a very steady policy 
they often state the policy with the financial statements and say, oh, our policy is um, to try and get the dividend to grow by 5% a year or something. Our policy is to pay high dividends, but we're not going to grow. Our policy is to pay lower dividends because we want growth. They tend to have a policy and they tend to stick to it. It's very dangerous, it's a big risk, if they suddenly change the policy and upset shareholders. Anyway, that's the clientele effect. The other danger, if a company changes its policy, is what's called the signalling effect. Suppose this company, for years, has always paid a dividend of around 20% of their earnings. Always. People are used to it. Well, suppose this year they decide to change and they say, well, this year we'll pay zero dividend. And suppose they're doing it for a very good reason. They're doing it uh, because they want to buy some new machines and they need the full 10,000. And shareholders shouldn't be worried because these new machines will grow the company more. No problem. But shareholders will be. Because the moment shareholders see that the dividends lower, they'll immediately assume the company's having problems. May not be the case. But again, it's psychological. If a company ever drops its dividend, shareholders are going to think there are problems and start getting worried and be unhappy. Uh, and as I say, there may be no reason at all to be unhappy. If they're dropping the dividend so they can grow the company, that may be terribly good. But it's very difficult often to convince shareholders I remember it's a long time ago now, and I can't remember the name of the company. There was a big company in the UK who did drop the dividends, not because they were having problems, but because they wanted to expand the company. And they had masses of publicity explaining to shareholders why they shouldn't be worried. You know, they got themselves interviewed on the radio and things saying shareholders shouldn't be worried, the company's doing well, and the lower dividend because we want to expand, we'll do even better in the future. Uh, but the trouble is shareholders ignored that, didn't believe them. They assumed there were problems they weren't being told about, and the share price dropped a lot. So, sorry, I'll stop going on here, but do be aware in theory, it shouldn't matter what dividends the company pays. In terms of whether big dividend, low dividend, whether they retain or they don't. In practice, they've got to be careful if they change the policy because of the clientele and the signaling effect. Okay, well that's enough on equity. In the next chapter, we'll have a chat about debt finance.